The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to this second session of the five-day program. My name is Manish and I'll be your host today. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. I just wanted to confirm before we go further, uh, am I audible enough? So you could raise your hand so that uh, I get to know. Yes, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Amiram. Thank you very much um, for confirming. We still have people fast joining in. I think we should give another about a minute or so before we get started. Today is going to be a very interesting session, so I still would like to give everybody a, a few more minutes. And when I say few, about a minute by the watch, I'll put myself on mute and the agenda is in front of you. Let's reconvene, don't go away in about a minute so that you know we have more and more people kind of joining in. All right, I think we have pretty much a full house. And uh, as I said, thank you so much for joining in. My name is Manish. We'll start the second session today. And what you see on the screen is the agenda. One moment, I have a, I have a question, one second. Carlos says, I'm not going to be able to join the webinars. Is there a possibility to download the five days? Yes, Carlos, all these webinars are being recorded and uh, it will be available. These will be available on the knowledge portal, uh, and you would be able to view them there. Uh, David says. David McGiven says, um, I had problem installing the demo stack. It seems some of the INET pub folder did not populate, which resulted in expired license. Can you throw some light on the possible cause, causes? Okay. Uh, hi, David. David McGiven. What you really want to do is. Uh, Try and restart the IIS. Okay, I'm sure you would have done all that. Uh, best way to do it, do this is to restart uh, the entire installation. If you have licenses problem, then just write an email to licenses at cityaccess.com. Mark me a copy. Give a mention that uh, you are trying to install a demo stack and you need a demo stack license, and that's how you would be able to get a uh, the licensing team would issue a new license. You can always raise a support ticket. Uh, support.cityaccess.com. As I said in my last session yesterday, uh, the support team, the global support team knows that there could be, uh, I mean, people could be asking for support, help, assistance in getting the demo stack installed. So they are aware. And uh, so you can just raise a ticket and I will follow it up, write an email for licenses. I'll have it all sorted without a problem. Okay. Um, uh, right, thank you. Well, you're most welcome, David. Now let's get started again. So on the screen is the agenda for today. Now, the good and the bad part is that the good part is I don't have any slides. Okay, we will all be talking directly onto the product because slides, uh, in my opinion, they, get, they can get slightly monotonous. Today's session, 
would be around configuration and master data. Will be I'll be talking at length on the enterprise setup, retail profile, the store setup. I'll talk about price list and price groups. But more importantly, this is the, the one of the most critical sections of the entire retail setup. Concept of tills, they're setting up, and we'll try and do an end of day transaction. What I've also done is I have uh, a receipt printer and a cash drawer installed and configured along with my installation here, which is a demo stack. I'll try and time permitting, I'll try and tell you how do you configure the hardware if you want to uh, in your demo stack installation so that you are able to kind of demonstrate a receipt printer, a cash drawer, simulate a real life kind of situation. So we'll talk about that also. Um, Yesterday, I was not able to talk at length about the fulfillment from a mobility device, though that's the last topic in the last session, but I'll try and cover that today. We did not talk about licensing yesterday, but I'll talk about that as well. And uh, so let's see how it goes. We have uh, sufficient time, about two hours, and uh, let's see how much I'm able to cover. I certainly would be able to cover these important sections. So with that said, um, I'm presuming most, if not all of you, would have your demo stack installation already done. As I said earlier, if you have any problem, please get in touch with support. Go to the support portal, support.citiexa.com, log in, create a ticket, send an email to me that you have logged a ticket, give me the ticket number, and I'll chase it for you. So that's how it's kind of going to work. So uh, that said, let's go straight into the management console in Ivan Retail. Now, for the benefit of those who were not able to join yesterday, I just wanted to go back to the slide and talk about the, the layout of the entire application. This is the one. So um, we'll talk about, this is the, how, this is the layout of how the, the entire Ivan Detail Management Suite is laid out and I use the firm laid out in its full glory. At, as I was selling yesterday, at the core is Ivan Enterprise Server. So this is a, basically a server class machine, which, is, which, could, which should have a static IP. This certainly should have a static IP. So it could be a part of, in the, it would be in the demilitarized zone. It could also be in, the, in any of the data centers if you so desire. But this device, this box should be accessible over the internet, should have a static IP only for the reason that only then the stores would be able to locate it and communicate it over the internet. Now this uh, application, the, the user interface or the front end of this application is what we call is the management console. The management console is basically that application which is installed both at the enterprise server, also at the store server. And this is the place where you carry out all the back office transactions. So we'll go there um, to the management console and try and explain uh, all that we want to do for today's session, essentially the, the enterprise, the retail profile, the tills, the concept of a till, how does a till actually look like, and so on and so forth. So I'll try and make it as simple as I possibly can. I presume, and, and I know uh, quite a few of you already have a retail background, so it may sound monotonous when I talk about the tills, but the idea is to try and explain the definition, the concept of tills as applicable in the context of Ivan Retail. So that's the whole objective. So when you get, when you install the entire application, when you when you apply the licenses, one of the first places where you have to enter information is the enterprise, which is administration, system initialization, enterprise screen. I'll just minimize this for a moment. There you go. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first thing that, that you mention is the is the name of the company, Acme Retail. Enter an email ID, the one that you deem fit. Address, if you want to put an address, you always can. Uh, mention the entire details here. The ERP system type, now this is where it could be different from, my installation could be different than yours because my has an SAP Business One as the ERP type running at the back end. Um, you could either install it in the unplugged mode where you, when you select, this is a one-time setting, all these settings are one-time setting. When you click this, you will be able to select the word unplugged. Localization, because it is um, 
the demo stack, it is US localization. You'll have to mention the sales tax and the purchase tax code. These are one time settings. Okay, a generic tax code. These are mentioned here because just in case the system is not able to find any tax code defined for an item or the customer or the location or the point of sale or the store, it will fall back all the way back up to the enterprise setting and pick up the most appropriate tax. Then there is a retail profile. We'll come to this at length when, once I'm done with this, with this enterprise setting here. You'll have to select a retail profile, okay? And as I said, this is a very uh, detailed section. I will cover pretty much almost half the time today. We'll go there after I'm done with this. But the next point is allow negative inventory. Mine says do not allow negative inventory. But let me first try and tell you the concept. As I said, most of you would be knowing it, but still for the context of Ivan Retail, let me try and explain. When you say allow negative inventory, what that means is what that means is that even if the books or the uh, or should have the system, the system inventory says zero stock and the customer is, is holding the particular article, the shirt in his hand, you should still be able to sell it. The concept is very simple. Okay, a retailer would like to sell whatever he has. System should not, an application, certainly the application inventory should not become any kind of constraint in him trying to sell whatever is available. So I'm saying irrespective whether the, the system shows inventory or says zero inventory, you should still be allowed to sell because there is a customer standing in front of you with a particular article, let's say a half sleeve shirt, and you should be able to scan and sell it. So I am always, this normally retailers allow the negative inventory, which is should be ticked in, okay? Now, the moment I tick it, it say, do you want to apply this to all the warehouses? I could say yes or I could say no. If I say yes, all my warehouses, including general warehouse, would have this option. They would allow negative inventory. For now, I'll just keep it as no, but <clears throat> this is an option. Um, this is an option uh, which essentially allows retailers to sell from their point of sale even if the system inventory is zero or negative. All right, so this is an important consideration. Now, extending this logic in the context of an ERP, okay? ERP could be either SAP Business One or any of the SAP product could be Sage, it could be Dynamics uh, 365 Business Central, any of the ERPs. Normally speaking, all the ERPs have a setting which says do not allow negative inventory. What that means is if the system says zero stock, you should not be able to sell it. So these are two conflicting, uh, should I say, settings. The first setting is in the retail, I'm allowing negative inventory, whereas in my ERP setting, in case I have an ERP in the backend, I'm saying do not allow negative inventory. So in the event, I have these two settings completely opposite in two different applications and I still sell at the point of sale. What happens is that transaction would not go into the ERP because ERP is not allowing a negative inventory. It will get stuck in the integration queue and would expect the user, any user, typically the store manager or someone at the head office to intervene and confirm that this negative inventory and resolve the negative, sorry, resolve the negative inventory. Okay, so these are two, uh, this is a very important setting. Normally, they are completely opposite in the two different applications. In the meantime, I think I have a question. Mm. Okay, so Farhan asked the question, what's the reason for retailers uh, not to allow negative inventory? Uh, there is, actually, they, shouldn't, they should allow negative inventory. There's no reason why they should not allow negative inventory. The concept is very simple. The customer walks into the store, he buys, let's say, he wants to buy a half sleeve shirt, a full sleeve shirt. He picks it up, goes to the counter, uh, to, the, to the register. The register, the cashier should be able to sell it. It will be so silly for the cashier to tell the customer, sorry, sir, I can't give you this shirt because my system says there is no inventory available. Okay, so that's the reason why retailers would always allow negative inventory. Now, flip the argument to when we're talking about um, a jewelry kind of an item. If I'm telling specialty retail, jewelry, expensive watches, such a situation one would not arise. And if it arises, then it's a 
indication of a much larger problem of pilferages than that of a system. Okay, so normally speaking, retailers would always allow negative inventory. There's no reason why they should not allow negative inventory. Okay. Um, Amiram has a problem. First time you open management course, I will log in. What should my oh yes. So when you install demo stack, I'm sorry guys, I'm flipping. Uh, I'm just trying to answer Amiram's question. He says, first time I opened the management console, it asked login. What should be the login name and password? The, your login ID is one and the password is pass at the rate one, two, three with P capital. This was a setting that would have, this was one of the screens that would have come up towards the end of the installation. Okay, one single screen. Uh, let me try and show that if I can. A moment. Let me flip all the way. That's the one. So you see the screen here. So when you ended, when you the uh, installation got over, it gave you the credentials. So your for handheld, for uh, customer portal, for e-commerce, etc. Everywhere the pass username is one, password is pass at the rate one to three. All right. Uh, Yes, most most welcome, Abiram. Then, Fezan wants to know: Is it possible to set negative inventory by by product? Mm. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I still have to confirm. I don't think it is possible to do that. It's a global setting at the enterprise level. But good question. I will have it confirmed. Wish, while I continue, can you just go to the product page and find out whether negative inventory is allowed or not? But I don't think. It is allowed. It's a global setting. Okay, uh, guys. Once again, thank you so much for making it so interactive. This is very important for me. It gives me the the understanding and idea that um, you know the the sessions are engaging enough. So thank you so much to that effect. So let's keep going. Uh, let's come back to this space. Allow. We talked about allow negative entry. Then you have a, a few more global settings, which talks about check credit limit. Now. This is typically for a B2B kind of a scenario, right? Um, or if you have customers who are registered customers, may or may not be loyalty customers, but certainly registered named customers, so to say. This option says, would you like to allow, uh, would you like to check the credit limit of the customer while transacting with him at the point of sale? So uh, it's a good idea to keep it, keep it kind of switched on to check the credit limit. Because that gives you a good idea. It also will help you in doing kind of any kind of analysis of what is the pending payment to the balances, running a dunning exercise, etc. So it's always good practice to uh, switch this thing on. That yes, uh, credit limit. Check the credit limit. Then I have another app option called Show Product by Vendor. So when you are uh, typically when you are trying to raise a purchase order. At that point in time, when you select a vendor, and we'll do the transaction, when you select the vendor or a supplier, uh, at that stage, uh, system will then display only those products which are mapped, so to say, with that particular supplier. So somewhere in the product master screen, item master screen, I have the ability to attach a, a supplier. So that setting takes uh, would would allow you to show products only from that supplier. Helps. It's a great help. When you are doing local procurement from within the store, okay, so it makes it that much more convenient and easy. Again, different businesses have different policies. Some of them allow local purchases. Some of them don't allow local purchases. If you have the the format of the retail store is slightly large, okay, where the store manager runs the store pretty much like a company, in that case, the store manager should have the option of raising a purchase order local purchase order. In that case, such a setting is of great help. Uh, then you have a few more settings, like for example, allow price change by GRPO. GRPO stands for good receipts against a purchase order. Okay. Uh, so this setting says, would you allow to change the price change? Would you allow any kind of price change while doing a GRPO? Again, um, it's it's a very debatable point, actually, whether you should or you should not allow. Large format retail stores, typically supermarket convenience stores, where the store manager runs the store as his own company, 
you may like to have that facility or you may not like to have the facility. So the options available here are, one second, let me take this away. The options available here are either you can hide, you can read only or editable. Uh, companies which have a centralized purchasing mechanism would not like to show their store managers or the cashiers at what price uh, they have bought the a particular article. So they hide it. Some of them just would like to have it editable because they would like the store manager to change it if in the case of local purchases. The next point being being pricing resolution. So in the in the event of a conflict, okay, uh, what should the system do to resolve a price list? Should it resolve to the lowest price or should it resolve to the highest price? Again, or you can just put it as none because the entire pricing, the entire pricing is determined multiple different levels. You have price list, you have special price list, you have discounts on products and groups, on customer groups, customers. You have promotions running. So you would much rather have this pricing resolution kept as none and have the other parts of the application which control the pricing determine what should be the pricing resolution. Normally, again, it depends retailer to retailer. Some of them would like to give the benefit to the, the consumer, the customer. Some of them would not like to do that. So it varies from retailer to retailer. Um, then another interesting setting, apply sale discount. Uh, when you want to apply the sale discount? Transaction total after tax or before the tax? So this again determines, again, this is more statutory in nature, varies from region to region, country to country. At some places you first give the discount, then the tax. At some places you give the discount on the tax um, after applying the tax. One global setting which determines all this. In the meantime, I have a question, I guess. Mm. One moment, one moment. It's strange that I'm not able to kind of project the questions. I mean, you are not able to see the questions pain, but I'm able to read them very clearly. So David's, David Webb says, my understanding is that allowing negative inventory becomes a consideration when integrating to an ERP because it causes issues with costing analysis it's no longer a problem with the current version no it's no longer a problem with the current version David the next is uh, Lister wants to know if you set allow negative inventory and the ERP reject the transaction how do you resolve it okay I'll answer this in a moment let me read all the other questions if you're linked to uh, your ERP system when credit limit is enabled will I even check the credit limit on the ERP system or from Ivan okay I'll answer this in a moment I'll answer this as well um, how does Faizan wants to know how do these global enterprise setting work if you have multi-country regional organization would you recommend enterprise in each region um, so okay so one question at a time very interesting ones one question at a time let me first try and answer uh, Lister's question so it says thank you David Webb thank you for uh, bringing this point up of negative inventory but let me try and answer Lister's question if you set allow negative inventory and the ERP rejects the transaction, how do you resolve it? So imagine a situation where the, um, the ERP has a zero stock, okay? My retail system also has a zero stock, but because of the inventory mismatch or whatever reasons, you still have inventory on the retail store. You, you pick that up, you scan it, you sell it. Now what we are trying to do, what the applications are trying to do is, one application is telling the other application that, listen, you have to reduce the inventory of this particular item in this particular store. That means you're trying to sell what you don't have. That means you haven't received enough to issue it out. And the only way you do that is by doing an inventory reconciliation. So you could do a, in the simplest of cases, do a good receipt, mention the reason for the good receipt and the transaction would go through, okay? Uh, in other cases, what you really want to do is, if this is an indication that there is a stock mismatch, a serious one at that, you want to then do an entire stock counting. We will show that in the Ivan allows you to do that. You do the inventory counting, and then you pass the adjust, adjustment entries. So let me try and explain this uh, a bit more. Okay, so let's say you want to do an inventory count in Ivan detail. There could be goods. Um, which are more than what the system says. There could be goods which, could, which are inventory more than what the system says, inventory less than what the system says. 
if you have goods which are more than what the system says, that means you have to issue them out. When you say issue them out, you have to pass a kind of a negative adjustment. You have to reduce the stock. So when you're reducing the stock, you're reducing the value of the stock. And when you're reducing the value of the stock, you would much rather reduce the value by the cost price at which you bought it. When you want to increase the inventory, when you want to increase the inventory, so that means the system says more, on the floor there are less. So you want to increase, sorry, the other way around. When you want to increase the inventory, that time also you want to use the entire adjustment you would much rather do based on the cost price rather than the selling price. So somewhere in the inventory counting screen in the application, when you start the inventory counting, it will ask you that for this particular inventory count, what are the price lists that you want to maintain, that you want to kind of manage. So the price list could be, you'd specify the price list, uh, that this is going to be a cost price price list and all adjustments are being will be done this is this price list and it becomes very interesting as you go along but short long answer to the very short question how do you do that you basically do stock reconciliation past adjustment entries okay then you uh, the next question is um, Peter wants to know if you're linked to an ERP system when um, check credit limit is enabled will I will check the credit limit of the ER system or of the I event so what happens is um, while both the applications are connected in a real and a near real-time mode essentially what we're trying to do we're replicating data selective master data is being replicated from the enterprise to the store server this is being done to to avoid a situation of complete shutdown in case the internet connectivity breaks so there is so credit limits and stock statuses etc are are bought into iwind on a periodic frequency, which could be as high as every 30 seconds or as infrequent as, let's say, once in a day. They're brought into IWIN detail. So the credit limit check happens in IWIN, not in ERP. The, the IWIN system does not go all the way to ERP to check the credit limit and come back. Okay, um, so that possibly answers the question. Um, then you have um, Fezan's question. Uh, one second, let me read it. How do these global enterprise settings work if you have a multi-country, multi-regional organization? Would you recommend an enterprise in each, in each region? Okay, so the answer to this is slightly long and, and winding. Uh, so let's first talk about a situation where we do not have an ERP in the back end. It will be easier for me to explain that way and then make it complicated by adding an element of ERP in between. So what really happens is Ivan Detail has a concept of subsidiaries. My system doesn't have the subsidiaries enabled, but we can define subsidiaries. So when we talk about subsidiaries, I'm talking about completely different legal entity, possibly in a different geography. So what Ivan does is, because Ivan is not an ERP solution, it allows creation of subsidiaries in different parts of the world, okay, in different geography. When I say different part of the world, essentially means in different, um, different should I say, uh, statutory, regions so one statutory region being different than another maybe the currency is different the laws are different it allows you to do that and all of them are connected to the main Ivan enterprise at the subsidiary level you will have a similar Ivan management console where you would define negative allowed or negative not allowed so let me try and explain this again and just try and get your head around this so Ivan again is a slightly multi-level structure so you have enterprise at the top you can define subsidiaries. Every subsidiary can have multiple stores. Stores could be individual or within a group, and every store will have point of sales. So that's broadly the hierarchical structure. Subsidiaries work very well if you're using Ivan in the unplugged mode, but if it is plugged into an ERP, subsidies don't really work because then becomes very complicated because you have a subsidiary structure in the ERP also, so you much rather do it that way. So. To answer your question, how do these global enterprise settings work if you have a multi-country, multi-regional organization? Short answer is if you have multiple different geographies and multiple different, uh, should I say, statutory requirements, you would much rather have multiple different Ivan retail installations. That's the easiest way to do that. Okay. Uh, yes, so you, um, Fezan himself answered the question. Would you suggest uh, uh, an enterprise in every region? Yes, I would suggest that. Peter wants to know, 
for say GRP 300 an error batch is created when negative stock is allowed uh, an error batch is created when negative stock is allowed on I when one dot on stage I think yes I will have to confirm this in all likelihood yes an error batch is created Lister wants to know does I went allow to adjust both quantity and cost uh, within it because it uh, with the other ERP it has to be done okay let's say yes so when you are doing the adjustment here you passing that adjustment transaction <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yes, yes, Peter. Sorry, I didn't get that. I thought possibly it's just an answer. For everyone else, what Peter is saying is that Manish, listen, for Sage ERP 300, an error batch is created when negative stock is allowed on IWIN but not in Sage 300. That's what Peter says. Thank you so much for clarifying. I thought it was a question. Sorry about that. Lister goes on to say, does IWIN allow to adjust both quantity and cost within it? Because with other ERP, that has to be done separately. Yes, Lister, uh, when you're passing the adjustment entry, okay, it'll ask what is the price list that you're asking for. You attach that price list and that transaction goes through the uh, replication to the head office, I mean the enterprise from enterprise all the way to ERP through the integration pipe. So you do that, you don't have to do it at two different places. Um, you just have to do it at one single place. Very good, thank you. Uh, let's keep going, let's keep going. <clears throat> so we were talking about um, sale discount on transaction before or after then the another one is support multiple transaction type mode okay what this means is when I'm trying to do a transaction and I and on I went point of sale typically a terminal point of sale I should be able to do multiple transaction types in the same transaction let me try and explain this so you walk into the retail store, you bought a shirt, you went back, you realize, oh, this is not working. I think I need a, a replacement. Or let's say I need a refund. So you go back to the retail store, says, guys, this is what I bought. I don't think I'm liking it. May I have something back? May I, the transaction needs to be refunded. Uh, you also decide, okay, fine, I'm returning a shirt. A full sleeve shirt let me try and wear a half sleeve shirt so now you go and you pick up a half sleeve shirt so a couple of things will happen now you have a refund transaction to be done and you have a sale transaction to be done uh, in simple cases what you'll do is you'll first do a refund finish the transaction then do another transaction which is a sale transaction depending upon how the retailer wants to do the business this tick allows you to ensure, can you do two transactions as in like a sale and a refund, a refund and a sale rather, in the same transaction, or would you like to do it separately? So this small little tick ensures that. The next one, allow multiple salesperson on transaction item. Uh, again, let's say, let's take the case of uh, speciality retail, let's say watches, expensive watches. So one set of people in the retail store are going to, are, will convinced me that Manish Omega is a good watch okay and the other set of people would actually sell it to me so the credit of selling the Omega watch to Manish would go to two separate people so would you like this small little text says would you like to have multiple salesperson attached to a transaction just to know okay then uh, there's another tick which says open sales attributes automatically sales attributes is again as a slightly larger topic we'll, we'll cover that as we go, go along in the sessions but what this means is if you want to capture any additional information other than what is already captured in the system you capture it by virtue of creating sales attributes now when you're trying to do a transaction and if you have configured the system to capture sales attributes at the transaction level every time a transaction is done would you like the system to open the sale attribute screen automatically or not? If you have sales attribute, I sincerely recommend that this should be ticked on. That you should uh, have it ticked, otherwise the chances are the cashier just might forget about it. Moving on, collect entire sales order amount in advance. Okay, this again is, uh, I mean, it's, it's very obvious, the name. Do you want to collect the entire sales order advance uh, amount in advance or not? Well, let me try and complicate this a bit further. So let's say you're buying a 60-inch television, all right? When you're buying a 60-inch television, you're placing an order. Obviously, you're not going to carry the 60-inch television along with you. You would much rather have someone from the retail store come home 
install and configure it for you. And you might say that, well, take 50% now, 50% on delivery. This stick ensures that whether you want to collect the entire money or not. Okay, I could, as, as a consumer, I could go say, a 16 inch television is good, send it home, get it installed. I want to see it running, only then I'll pay for it. Fair enough. Most of the retailers agree. Now, in addition to the normal sale transaction or the normal sales order, the retailer would also be spending some money in the transportation installation configuration of, oh, let's say, 16 inch television. And the retailer would be would be wanting to kind of collect that additional surcharges from the customer. So it in Ivan Retail, it is possible to attach additional surcharges on the full, it's called the fulfillment, fulfillment surcharges. We'll come to that as we move along. I am I would allow you to capture those additional surcharges. And not only that, it also says that even if Manish says is not going to pay anything for the television. Manish would still be expected to pay for the surcharges, which is transportation, installation, and installation configuration costs. So short point to the, basically what it says that you want to collect the entire thing in advance or not. And similarly, you can also configure the system somewhere that says, do you want to collect the surcharges in advance or not? You can do, do both ways. Normally, collect the entire sales or in advance, this is switched off, and the surcharges for fulfillment are switched on. And that I will show as we move along. I don't want to flip screens right now. The next one is gift certificate allows sale and redemption in a single transaction. Simple and obvious. So I'm, let's say, uh, me and my wife go shopping. Okay, she gives me gift certificate for my, let's say, birthday. Would we? Would I be able to buy the gift certificate and redeem it in the same transaction? This is pretty obvious and simple. Some people allow, some people don't allow. As a retailer, I might say that, well, you're buying the gift certificate now. You can't redeem it right away. You'll have to come at a certain date or a separate transaction. The next one is automatically select serial or batch numbers. This is interesting. So uh, let's say you have serial and batch controlled items. Okay, so when you're trying to sell a serial controlled item, let's say television in this case, when you receive those those televisions, you would have entered the serial number somewhere. So when you're trying to sell it, would you like the serial number to be manual first? Or should it be manual or should it be automatic? And this setting is more applicable in the context of a batch controlled item that how do you want the system to manage the sale of batch controlled item? Would you allow the cashier to select the batch manually or should the system first show you the expired ones uh, I mean, the ones which are going to expire soon, the lowest price first, highest price first, creation date, only if one is applicable. So this setting, more applicable in the context of batches than serials, because serials, serial numbers are very specific. You should be allowed to select them manually. But otherwise, uh, the batch control items, when, you're, when we are selling batch control items, the system should, should the system pick up the ones which are expiring soon or the lowest price, the highest price creation, only one is possible. Okay, then you have allow user defined product ID. Okay, which means uh, the product ID, when you try to, this is very, I mean, again, debatable. I find it rather silly, but still, uh, someone would have requested it, that's why it is there. Okay, what this means is, Allow user defined product ID. What I'm what trying to say is that one, it is possible to create uh, product IDs from the point of sale, from the management console, or from the ERP. Let's say management console and, and the point of sale. And second is what's saying is the user, the cashier, or the back office store manager has the option of defining a new product just at random. They just give a whatever product ID that they so desire. Okay, allow partial receiving inventory. This is again very important that when I'm receiving something, uh, typically good to see it against a purchase order or normal or maybe stock transfer receipts, would you allow me to receive partial or not? Replication batch size 5000. This is slightly techy. Let's move on. I'll just skim through this. Uh, allow add item in good return for GRPO. So, what this means is 
At the time of good receipt against the purchase order, if you want to do a goods return, then the item should be added automatically. Does not necessarily mean the transaction will go through. It's just that to save time, we're just allowing it to be added automatically uh, uh, in the GR goods return at the GRPO stage. Allow backdate at allow backdate at end of day process. Okay, this again is very obvious. Would you like to have a backdated transaction at the end of the day? So, okay, what that also means is that today, for example, uh, today is the 12th of March. Okay, can I do on 12th of March? Can I do the end of day for let's say 1st of March? Can I do that or not? That's what this setting allows. Typically switched on. Allow duplicate barcode on product, whether you want to have more than one. Uh, uh, for the same product, more than one barcodes. Expiry date required for batch item or not. Expiry date required for a serial item. Rather silly, but still expiry date required for serial item. Assign customer vendor to all branches. Uh, <clears throat> use advanced authorization. We'll come to advanced authorization when we talk about users and their rights. Allow over and under receiving at the GRPO stage. Under receiving obviously is possible. You can always receive less than what you'd ordered for. But imagine a situation where you receive more than what you'd ordered for. So let's say you ordered for 15 pieces, but the batch size is only 10. So you either receive 20 or just 10. So would you allow the system to receive more than what you'd ordered for? Normally it is switched on. Okay. Allow over receiving for stock transfers. Again, this is very obvious. This is switched on. Uh, then you have one second. Let me just move it up. Then you have uh, inventory count merge setting. So when you're counting the inventory, okay, your inventory, when you're counting the inventory in a large store, the inventory counting could be spread over maybe two days. So in that case, what the system does is this setting allows you to ensure, this setting allows you to ensure that what should be, when you finish accounting, should the counting be finished for for the current date, the earliest date or the latest date. Okay. Uh, enable locations. Locations again is a very interesting concept uh, in Ivan detail. Locations. Imagine locations to be logical segregations, logical area within the store where you could keep inventory. For example, significant part of the store is saleable location. Whatever is there in the store, you have to sell it. But there are some sections in the store which are, let's say, these are damaged items, these items for repairs, and so on and so forth. You can have those uh, small little segregated areas where you specify that these are for uh, returns, damaged, repairs, uh, rework. So if you say enable locations, you would be able to create those logical areas, number one. And second, once you create those logical locations, if you may, you would also be able to specify Okay, these are the locations from where I can sell. These are the ones from where I cannot sell. And let's say if I'm doing a goods return, then in a good return, return transaction, the location should automatically be selected as return goods. So this small little tick ensure that locations are enabled or not enabled. In this, in this installation, locations are enabled. Then you have enable log replication. Uh, that means all replications that, that are happening across the entire retail chain, would you like to maintain a log of them? Allow zero price items, which is almost the same as saying uh, you're, you're basically selling samples. Okay, so you could sell something at a zero price and system will still allow you to do that. Slightly tricky, slightly tricky, you have to be, use it very carefully. Uh, but the system does have a setting which says allow zero price items and then the next one is update inventory status within a store group so store group let's say you're running 150 stores okay and you want to see inventory of an item you would be shown a list of all 150 stores it will become that much more difficult for you to figure out which store to go to and it doesn't go to so what system allows you to do is to create groups store groups so the store groups are basically logical grouping of stores within a uh, vicinity. Uh, okay, so those are those, you can define those groups. So 150 could be divided into, let's say, uh, 
15 groups of 10 each okay so so these are stored groups so whenever you are trying to do from the point of sale when you're trying to look for for an inventory for an item which is not there in your store it will show you you have the option of seeing the different stores available within the vicinity as it is in your group to see the inventory and what this tick does is it will update the inventory status only within the store group on that i think i'll take a small little pause and open the forum for questions there are some of them uh, Robin wants to know, can you add additional new product to the GRPO when it does not exist the PO, but supplier has invoiced it? I think you can do that. Yes, you can do that. <clears throat> Very risky, but yes, you can. Uh, do you have the drill down ability from group to the store? No, we don't. No, we don't have. This was a question from Felipe who wants to know, uh, do you have the drill down ability from store group to the store? What you do, what you have essentially is, once you define the groups, the stores that are visible to you, unless you have, uh, uh, depending on the rights that you have, uh, uh, you would only be able to see those stores within the group. When you say drill down, I think what you're asking for is, can I actually go inventory at the group level, inventory at the store level, and so on and so forth, maybe at inventory at the location level. No, I can't drill it down that way, but a report certainly can be created, can, can certainly be created. I hope that answers the question, Felipe. All right, did I miss any other question? One second. I think I answered most of them. Very good. Um, Felipe has the next question. Can you range products by store that allow a collection of products in a given store yeah, yeah certainly yes certainly yes you can certainly do that that means these are the products available only to this store or, or these store group yes you can do that you certainly can do that that's certainly is possible all right uh, any other question guys please all right so I'll I'll keep walking keep going <clears throat> We actually have a lot of ground to cover today. Oh, wait, there's one more question. A moment. Out here. I think that's good. I'm actually at the same time trying to manage the uh, manage the the go to webinar control panel. Is the question Spain uh, John wants to know duplicate barcodes can barcode represent different pack sizes for an item yes 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 very very pertinent question thank you so much for asking John we have a concept of barcode masking okay when we talk about barcodes we'll go there okay normally barcodes are basically you define a barcode when you scan a barcode it resolves the item and system resolves the pricing that's the simplest form of a barcode okay so rather than what we're trying to do is rather than someone actually typing the code 4001012 you just scan it and be done with it but if you want to have more information in the barcode itself like for example it's expiry date the pack size etc you have the option of creating a barcode mask which says the first three digits would be this the next would be these and the others would be that so you can you can certainly um, create uh, barcode masking and barcode masking has two different uh, ways of doing it one is fixed length and there is one more there's one more I'm forgetting so um, so short answer John yes it's possible to do that we have barcode masking Felipe wants to know can an item can an item uh, have more than one barcode if it comes in three boxes for instance can an item have more than one barcode if it comes in three boxes for instance i mean in that case you would typically have uh, the barcode on the item which is different than the barcode on the box when you scan the box it says pack of three or maybe pack of six or uh, whatever but you would have two separate barcode the barcode on the item would always be the same that will always be normally industry standards en13 you normally have an en13 kind of barcode printed on the on the product 
but a different barcode on the on the packing, which is a pack of six. Uh, Robin wants to know when barcode with the barcode masking and the expiry date. Can you see what is about expired? Yeah, yeah, certainly yes. Yes, Robin, you can always see that. You don't have to go all the way to barcode masking. If you have batch control items, system will will tell you these are the items expiring soon, and you could run kind of a promotion buy all five for a fixed price or things like that. Now John says something else. The question was, uh, can two different barcode exist such that each one represents a different uh, different pack? But why, okay, John, let me open the lines. Give me a second, let me unmute you one moment. So it will be easier for everyone to ask. One second, let me, oh, did I, one moment. One moment, just give me a second. There you go. I have I've unmuted the line. Can you ask the question again? Hi. It was asked the other hi. It was asked the second question. Uh suggested can different barcodes represent the pack size can we configure an item such that it has more than one barcode and each barcode represents a different pack size so we can sell singles or a pack of six yes, yes. and it just uses a different barcode that's that's that was the question and you answered that for the all right on okay. the, when the second person came up all right as opposed to the masked barcode all right. All right. Thank you. I'll mute. I'll, I'll mute you back. Sorry about that. I'll just mute you. All right. It's okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my friend George. Hi, George. Uh, George wants to know if a supplier sends additional items other than what was ordered, we would like to receive the item using service items so that our stocks are not affected by the GRPO, but the GRPO matches supplies and vice the tax requirement. We did this for Kenya Rwanda. Well, you could certainly, I mean, you certainly have the option of not receiving it uh, at all, okay, and the GRPO stage. I understand the statutory requirement, but pretty much the same uh, in other developing countries, that you have to receive what was ordered for it. You can't receive, you buy apples, you don't, you, you can't receive oranges, okay, so that's, you certainly can, and I don't think it's a good idea to receive the items using a service item. No, you would not do that. You would just not receive them. Just keep them separately. What you really want to do is receive them, put put a different location, um, put them in a different location, do a location transfer, put them in a separate place, and then sort it out with the supplier, and then regularize it. Okay. Um, Philippe says an example of that is bedding industry. So you sell a bed. That's that's an SKU, and a bed is made of a base head. Oh yeah, yeah, Philippe. I'll um, I'll answer this in a moment. David suggests. Uh, alternate UPC codes can handle multiple barcodes with different quantities. Yes, that is one way to do it. That's an easier way to do it. Thank you, David, for explaining. So to the point, what Philip is asking is uh, bedding industry, you can sell a bed. That's an SKU, yes. And the bed is made up of base, uh, bed head, and a mattresses. Now, this is more of a kit. Okay, This is more of a kit where you have, you sell the whole thing as a kit where the individual items, should there be need, can also be sent, sold separately, but they're typically sold as a kit. So that's a completely different thing called a kitting exercise. When you define an item, okay, when we define the item called bed, you say this is a kit, and then you specify the items in a kit so that when the cashier is selling, he sells the entire bed. So three items get reduced from the inventory. And if, uh, you know, someone like, I walk in and say, I only need the mattress, nothing else, that he should be able to, to kind of break the kit or unbreak it and then sell me only the mattresses. But to the point of multiple barcodes, an easier way to do that would be to have alternate UPC codes. Thank you, David, for answering this for me. All right, so let's let's keep walking. Let's keep going. <clears throat> okay, so then you have, we are still in the enterprise setting. We've done a bit of the global work. Then we go to interstore transactions. Okay. So whether you want to allow interstore transactions or not is the second option. The first one is allow delivery from a general warehouse. 
what that means is you could typically be having let's say 15 stores these 15 stores are have let's say maybe five distribution centers attached again let's say you are in the electronic industry some of the goods are available in the store you sell it from the store right? some of them would obviously 60 inch television would be there in the distribution center or the warehouse and you would like the transactions to be done directly from the from the delivery the day the delivery from the sorry from the general warehouse so if you want such an option you just click this so the warehouse that you define is not a retail warehouse but is a general warehouse and we'll come to that when we define stores so it's a general warehouse warehouse but you would still like imagine uh, uh, an Ivan management console installed and deployed there so that you could do the delivery transactions for there from there then you have another tick which says I'll use interstore transactions what that means is you book an order in the store have it delivered from the other one that could be the case of when you use interstore transactions you'll excuse me for rushing it because we really have some some a significant amount of topic to cover. We'll come to this again towards the end of the session, should time permit. Then you have the transaction server. Okay, is the transaction server integrated? Exchange transaction between the store, transaction search type, maximum reports, maximum records count to return, and the validate transaction quantity on refund. But before we go there, I think we have a few questions. Let me try and address them. Um, so Alex wants to know is it possible to use is it possible to use only good receipt for receiving goods without the pre-orders is it possible to change the good receipt via demo um, let me read again sorry Alex is it possible to use only good receipt for receiving goods without pre-orders yes that's a good option to do that do good receipt without the pre-orders is it possible to change a delete good receipt no if you've already done it then you can't change it so that's the reason why they grid out in the demo and the in the demo stack. <clears throat> uh, Robin wants to know: Does the cost of an item transfer to when interstore? Oh, this is very interesting. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for asking this. I'll answer this one at a time. It's it's slightly more than that. It's more than the cost. More than COGS values. It's basically who gets the credit for the sale. So we'll, I'll answer that question. It's a slightly longish talk, topic. Give me a moment. All right. So let's go back to the. Um, interstore transactions for a moment okay and let me try and explain a situation so what happens is let's say a uh, customer walks into the store he wants to buy let's say a full sleeve shirt blue but the shade of blue is not available and the cashier says sir the shirts are available in the store nearby would you like to place the order here and have it delivered to you at home or would you like to go there and pick the order you want me to reserve the inventory so let's say the use case is where the customer walks in he doesn't get what he wants to he places the order pays for it but the goods are uh, shipped out from the other store so system has the option of uh, managing this where it says okay who should get the credit of the sale and which COGS should be hit. So cost of goods sold will be hit off the other store because that's where the goods actually got delivered. This guy who actually sold it gets a credit for the sale. It becomes more interesting when the customer walks back and says, okay, I want to return this. I don't need it anymore. Okay, in that case, uh, which COGS should be hit? Either the store A or B. So the COGS of that store from where it was shipped, oh, so where it is being returned, those COGS values, when I say COGS, I mean cost of goods sold, uh, that account would be hit and the other guy gets the credit. So it's it's uh, slightly more, uh, slightly deeper than what it's kind of says allow into sort transaction, yes or no. You can set up that where and how the COGS should be uh, managed. I think on that I have, I would have, certainly I would have a few questions once again. No, I think I'm good. So short answer, Robin, yes, the cost of item gets, does get transferred to the other store. All right, so let's go to the next, which is my transaction server. So Ivan Retail allows uh, installation of SQL Express at the retail store. SQL Express 
uh, has its own set of limitations. For example, only 10 GB of data. Beyond that, it can't it can't hold the data. You would then be expected to move to the standard edition or maybe the enterprise edition. So what what normally most of the retailers do is they use the SQL Express option at the retail store. Now what happens is uh, there will come a point in time when you would have consumed the entire 10 GB of data. So system allows you the option to purge the transactions at the retail store because mind you all transactions from the store are anyways get replicated at the head office. So transactions the transaction anyways are safe at the head office or the central location level. You could purge the transactions here. This is slightly different where it what it does is it says uh, if, if let's say a customer walks into the retail store says I want to I want to have a, a refund of the transaction that I did let's say four months ago. You may not have that transaction on the local server. In that case what this what this setting does is it says is the transaction server integrated? So transaction server is not a server server kind of a, uh, an application. It's more of a, a kind of a web service of sorts where it allows the search of a transaction first in the local store and then if it is not available, then it goes all the way to the enterprise, fetches the transaction back and these settings determine that. So can I exchange the transaction data between the store? Yes or no. So first is, is the transaction server integrated? That means if I have to search the transaction, then I would first search it locally and then local and, and then go to the enterprise. And then the second option is exchange transaction data between stores. So what that means is should all the stores have all the transactions all across. So I have let's say five stores, every store doing 100 transactions. So all the 500 transactions are available in all the five stores. Do you want that or you don't want that? That's what it, it typically means. And what is the maximum record count? And you want to validate quantity on refund. So uh, when you're trying to do a refund transaction, do you want the system to validate uh, against the original transaction? Okay. I think on that I have a few questions. Can a point of sale work standalone without the store server? Okay, it's a very interesting question. Okay. Uh, short answer yes yes it can what that means is and let, on that I will open the the slide here one moment just one second so the question is that if the point of sale do I have an offline point of sale that's what the question is Point of sale working without the connection to the local server. Yes, you can do that. You will have to configure the point of sale in the offline mode. Okay, this is a feature uh, we are enhancing than what it was currently in the new version. So when my version next version comes out sometime in June 6.6, .6, that will have an enhanced offline point of sale. We still have. I mean, the application still has an offline POS functionality. Uh, we we recommend that an offline pass is to be used when in situations where you have no more than two point of sales in a particular retail store and the number of the entire application landscape is slightly more manageable around 10 15 stores otherwise it becomes difficult for the application to keep uh, to effectively manage the differential integrity of the entire data so typically apparel footwear kind of retailers small footprint on every retail store and number of stores also being that much more manageable in such cases we recommend well in such cases we recommend an offline offline terminal point of sale mobile point of sale anyways works in the offline mode so it has its own set of database so when you have a terminal point of sale in the offline mode what that means is that even if this connectivity between the point of sale and the store server were to break for whatever reasons the terminal point of sale will continue doing transactions it does so by maintaining a small little um, SQLite database at the point of sale level. And the moment this connection goes off, that's when the database takes over. Till as such time, it keeps on pooling uh, and synchronizing the data between the terminal pause and the store server. So short answer, yes, it's possible, but with certain caveats of sorts, 
when is it that you should be using it and how you should be using it. Uh, I think that kind of answers Amiram's question. Let's keep walking. <clears throat> then I have a concept of transaction rollup. Okay. So I have switched this thing off, but imagine a retailer who has maybe 20 stores, every store having maybe five point of sales, and the volume of transactions is that much more higher. Let's say I'm trying to do roughly about across the retail enterprise, about 20,000 transactions in a day. So currently what happens is, and this is a setting which is more applicable in the context when you're trying to, when you have an ERP at the back end. So typically when you do a sale, when you do a sale at the point of sale, it should it should create some kind, of, it should create an invoice in the back office accounting of the ERP system. But if you're doing 10,000 transactions in a day, as in like sale transactions only, then the system would create 10,000 such invoices in the back office it will put an unnecessary load and I'm I would typically be essentially be duplicating the data I have the entire transaction set in Ivan retail by not rolling it up I'm creating a, a completely parallel and a duplicate set in my ERP application also I would much rather do have my entire transaction data in Ivan retail at the at the enterprise level and then roll up the transactions and have consolidate them before putting into the ERP because the guys who manage ERP are more bothered about the financial impact of a transaction rather than the individual transaction per se. So what it does is, okay, whether this these settings say whether you want to use a transaction rollup or not first. Second, rollup roll up only cash customer invoices. So, you know, in a retail environment, not all customers are registered customers. Significant part of them are also cash customers. So you just roll up all cash customers, all cash customers into one single invoice and post that to one single invoice in the in the back office uh, application. Then the other setting says use store cash customer for roll up. That means uh, first one says only cash customers have to be rolled up. The second one says every store, the, every retail store that you define an event would, would need a cash customer attached to it. So saying when you're rolling it up, use the cash customer. Then you have the interval type. What that means is when do you want to roll it up? Do you roll up at the end of the day or you roll up after a specific so many hours? And if you say pick up after so many hours, then you specify the interval and when do you want to roll up. So on that, I think I'll take a small pause and open the forum for questions. So George wants to know, does activating or not activated transaction rollup have effect on the growth of the enterprise? Oh, yes, certainly, yes. Oh, when you say enterprise database, Ivan Retail would always have all the transactions. So for the benefit of the audience, let me kind of read the question again. My George, my friend George from Kenya wants to know, does activating or not activating transaction rollup have an effect on the growth of enterprise database size? So Ivan Retail, the enterprise database, would always have all the transactions. So whether you roll them up, or you don't roll them up, doesn't really matter. What rolling up would have an effect is it will ensure that the size of your ERP, which is at the back end, could be any of the ERPs, could be Business One, 365 Business Central, Sage 300, Sage EM, uh, or the other SAP products. That size is maintained and kind of Curtailed. I'm I by using transaction rollup. I'm not duplicating transactions into separate application. That's what uh, it actually does. I hope that kind of answers the question, George. Um, anybody else? Any other question? I'll just take a small little pause. I'll just run through the questions that I have. Very good. Uh, now that I've taken a pause, I just want to change the top. Oh, well, there's a question. Hang on, give me a second. So Felipe wants to know, is there an easy way to audit an ERP transaction? Well, Felipe, I think I'll, I'll much rather 
unmute you and you will be able to ask the question better. Yes, Felipe, can you can you hear me? Your lines are unmuted. Can you ask the question? Yes, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, rolling up transactions between the IVEN server and ERP. Um, if the uh, staff at, e at the ERP level look at a summarized transactions uh, transaction and they'd like to audit it, so they want the detail, you know, is there an easy way to link that summarized transaction to all the details that made it up? Uh, let me actually try and show that to you. Give me a second. So I'll, I'll open up the ERP. This is SAP Business One. I have picked up SAP Business One for sake of convenience. There's uh, no other reason. I could have picked up Sage 300 as well, which is, or maybe Business Central. It's just that I just picked this up. So let me try and show you a sale, an AR invoice transaction that happens, uh, that kind of gets integrated into the ERP. Okay. I pick up the last one. This is just one single transaction. For me, in my setup, I have switched off rollup. But what will happen is if you pay attention on this side, okay, this says this is the transaction TRX MP1, whatever 665. This is the IVEN transaction and the corresponding transaction in SAP Business One is let's say 451. What will happen is you would have a transaction called 451, and this transaction ID, rather than being a transaction ID, uh, would have a mention which says that yes, it is rolled up transaction. You would have to go to Ivan Retail to see the details of it because those details are not available in this application, which is the ERP. They are available in the other one, but the linking nevertheless is maintained as to which all transactions rolled up to create such a transaction here. So I didn't know whether that's an easy way of doing it or not, but that's possibly the only way to do it. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think I have a few more questions. Let's try and address them. So Peter wants to know, answering the roll-up of Sage 300, one batch is created as an import to Sage 300. There is there's no detail of how much amount is made, only reference to Ivan roll-up ID. In Ivan, you then can see what is made up of. Yes, yes, Peter. Yes, that's how it works. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, I know you're answering. Thank you very much for helping me out. Uh, so let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, come back to Ivan Retail here. And we did transaction roll up. After that, things are rather easy. Whether loyalty is whether Ivan loyalty is active and integrated or not. That's one last. And the last one is what's the enterprise logo? Now, this is a uh, I wouldn't say an important thing, but when you're trying to demonstrate the application, it makes sense to, to you know, cut out a logo from the prospect's website. It just looks that much more, uh, I would say, neat and gives the impression, and rightfully so, that some amount of homework or hard work has gone in, into, into presenting the solution. And then at the enterprise level, we have to specify the custom series. Uh, Custom series when you want to create a customer, custom series when you want to create a vendor or a product. What this means is the reason I'm doing it here is that uh, in case such a custom series is not available at the store level or at the point of sale level, then the system has the option of falling back all the way up to the enterprise. And why only three, customer, vendor, and product? Because these are three of the important masters which are bi-directional in nature in case of an uh, in case of uh, an integrated ERP system. So these are the three which are bi-directional in nature. I think I have one question, one more question here. <clears throat> uh, Peter wants to know, does this logo pull through the invoices, e-commerce site, etc.? Invoices, yes. Invoices, yes. All the reports, yes, but not e-commerce. For e-commerce, it has to be uploaded through the e-commerce admin panel because that's where it picks up, because Ivan e-commerce has its own database. Some of, most of the things are, are common, like for example, articles, customers, price lists, taxes, 
one image, all these are common. They kind of get integrated from, uh, let's say, a Sage to uh, Ivan and then all the way to Enterprise. But there's some which have to be done individually, Logo being one of them. All right, so this is this takes care of uh, one rather important screen. <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, retail profile, but before we go there, I just want to very hurriedly run through this. Uh, one setting I did not mention is import the settings. So this is a, a setting. What happens is, imagine you are running a slightly large implementation, and you have before you go to production, you have your development server and then the testing server. <clears throat> so if you have set up everything on the UAT server, the way the customer expects, the, the configuration spaces which the customer has given you, the user acceptance testing, you could, you could then import these settings. You can export the settings from, um, from the other system and import it here. So that's what it is all about. Communication settings talks about the integration of Ivan Retail into digital passes, Ivan um, Passbook. If you have installed a demo stack that somewhere in the installation it would have asked towards the end, what's a user ID and password for Passbook? So if you have, you can click it here. You can always go to Passbook setting and specify the username, the password, gift certificate template, coupons, loyalty. Uh, and the email templates for gift certificate coupons and loyalty. So these are templates. I will take a separate session and try and explain this very interesting concept as to how the whole thing really works. But for now, uh, whether this is integrated or not, and if yes, what are the passbook, uh, passbook settings? API, what is the full server address? Enable SSL or not, and what's a server address? This is the address of this particular machine running here, but that's what you mentioned. What this also means is, uh, I could have my API server other than this enterprise server. So in that in that diagram, I could have a separate box, which is my API server. Let's say maybe this one, small little one. <clears throat> so if I have a separate uh, API server is separate, then I need to give the uh, server of, in any case, I have to give the, the server address of the API server, which could may or may not be the same machine. Then I give the SMTP details. In this case, again, very interesting. You should you should have a you should know this. The SMTP details that I'm using are that of a demo account that I've created on SendGrid. So SendGrid allows you. Uh, I mean, you can always subscribe to SendGrid, but um, these guys are the most lenient ones and give you, uh, I think, a thousand messages in a day, a thousand emails in a day is what they give you for free. So I created a. Uh, Go to SendGrid, create an account, get up the get up the get the API, the the um, the password, the API key. Give the server port of this machine from where you want to allow the uh, the communication to happen, whether or not you want to have SSL or not. Similarly, I've integrated Nexmo for my um, sending out messages. So my SMS gateway is Nexmo. There are few with whom we are integrated. Okay. So these are the ones with whom we are into click a tell, click send, next more, and so on and so forth. So this one uses next more. And because it is already integrated, it will pick up the associated assembly name and the class name. And then you can go to the SMS configuration, specify the API key, etc. Then you have test email and test MS. You want to test all of this. The reason I am saying mentioning communication settings is because of this part, the SMTP detail part, which is heavily used for my campaign purposes. You don't really want to give your office SMTP details. You much rather use SendGrid for demo and, uh, for testing and demo purposes. So that takes care of that part. System display settings is is this gives you information of how you want to display it. Okay. Uh, then you have country. Um, country, state, zip code, etc. But what's important, uh, what is important here is uh, the document number series, which spoke, we spoke about the document number series. But in case you are, you are running the unplugged mode, 
in the unplugged mode for a point of sale, what are the series that we're talking about? So what is the prefix, suffix, start number, end number, start date, end date, etc. So we mentioned the, just like any other transaction series, number, nothing too great about it. Okay. Uh, that's as far as this is concerned. I will, again, take a small little pause and try and answer questions if there are any. Uh, Robin wants to know, uh, when import setting is used, does it also include all the products, supplier, etc., from the configuration of the UAT server? That's a separate process, I think. It's not here. Uh, I will still have to confirm. Wish, can you make a note of this uh, as to what does import setting means? Does it mean to uh, import just the settings of the enterprise, or does it mean to import the entire master data? I don't think it means that. Uh, but we'll still confirm. Uh, so John wants to know what is the format format of the test email ID on the test email within communication settings. Well, let's let's try and see that. Let's go to communication settings, test email. Look at just test email ID. Manish. That's a tongue twister. So you just, that's a test email ID. Not sure whether that answers the questions or not, but from a format standpoint, that's a format. And I got the, uh, I got the email, yes. Um, Peter wants to know, if you have multiple stores, must you have different document number series for each store? Uh, how does the enterprise server list the invoice number? For example, invoice store one, this store to that, and for other stores, okay. So for every store, you ideally should have a separate number series. Okay, let me try and we'll, we'll come to that uh, right now, but let's jump the gun. Go to store, pick up the main, it's the main store, okay? And I have custom series here. So this is my series for customer, vendor, and product if I'm doing it at the store level. So, so the enterprise custom series would be picked up only if the store series are not available. Okay, so that's the fallback mechanism. But if you have the store series available, it will not go to the go to the enterprise at all. I think that answers that question. Uh, how does enterprise server list the invoice numbers? Example of invoices: store one, this store one, two. Yeah, pretty much on these lines, Peter. Yes, pretty much on these lines, because you have individual series for individual stores. That's how so it'll list it that way. So when you see the invoice in this particular case from this store, okay, it will uh, create the the numbers accordingly. All right. So let's try and now go to the next important point, which is my retail profile. Now, retail profile, imagine retail profile to be a, a template of sorts, okay? It's a, it's a template which can be attached at different levels in the, in the retail environment. It could be at the enterprise level, it could be at the store level, it could be at the point of sale level, or it could be at the cashier level. But depending upon who, and that's how the system resolves the, the uh, should I say, retail profile, it checks up for the, for the cashier, then the point of sale, then the store, and then the, at the enterprise level. Typically, these are at the uh, store level, is what I would say, detailed profiles. Code description, easy part. Uh, then you have a default uh, transaction module. Excuse me, I'm rushing through. I will have to rush through this uh, because we have one huge, the template is rather huge. And second, I want to try and show you uh, the concept of a till and uh, the entire till management and how uh, we do the end of day. So, well, I'll try and we'll do a few transactions. We'll do the end of day and then do the entire transaction. So, we need some time for that. I only have about 35 minutes left, so I need to cover a lot. Okay, so code description easy. Default transaction mode is sale. Now, 
these are the possible different transaction modes which are possible on the point of sale i could it could be a sale or an exchange a refund a special order levy or a quotation i think a few more no, that's it so what that means is if this retail profile is attached to the point of sale whenever the cashier logs in what should be the default transaction mode so let me try and show that to you if you see this the default transaction mode is sale here okay i could have different transactions a sale or a refund or an exchange or a special order or a coupon a gift card quotations or levies now the reason why this is important the reason why this is actually mentioned here is because you could have a retail store which has a separate uh, register or a counter or separate area for returns and exchanges in that for that particular point of sale in that store you really don't want the cashier to every time whenever the transaction has to happen go here pick up a refund as as a transaction type or maybe exchange as a transaction type so this is a counter which is only for exchanges and you don't you just want the cashier always to be in the sale exchange mode that's what this small little option does here then you have auto lockout pause timeout in seconds so in so many seconds ideal pause um so basically 150 seconds is what it takes for the point of sale to get to get into the uh to have the screen server started similarly for the management console um so this one auto close complete sale view in seconds so when i'm completing the when i'm completing the sale when i do i have uh so let's say this is saleable i pick this up so this is an exchange give me a second guys i don't want to do exchange transaction why the transaction Four zero zero one zero one two. So basically, that setting what it does is when I complete a transaction, how long, for how long should it wait? So if I do a cash, cash transaction here, I say no. You would hear the cash drawer opening, and then you'll also hear uh, the printer printing. That was the cash drawer. That was the receipt printer and this weight that we waited here okay is what that small little pick says that how long should you wait for the transaction to, uh, to go through i think i have a question here one second okay ramzi wants to know default transaction mode can affect only one pause in one store how can i choose which boss in that case what you really want to do is so ramzi let me read the question again for the benefit of everyone what ramzi wants to know is default transaction mode can affect on, affect one pause only in the store how can i choose which point of sale the way you want really want to do this is in that case uh, you attach the, the you attach the retail profile the retail profile to that particular point of sale and i'll show that to you how it really works but you certainly can do that. Fazan wants to know, um, can we use a retail profile to restrict or limit which items can be sold at the point of sale? No, you can't do that. Okay, let me read the question again. Can we use the retail profile to restrict or limit which items can be sold at the POS belonging to that retail profile? No, you can't do that. Okay, what you really want to do is restrict the sale of the item from a completely different place, certainly not from a retail profile. Retail profile essentially controls the behavior of the point of sale application depending upon either who is logged in, second, which point of sale terminal or mobile is attached to, or which store does it depend to. So it's a hierarchical mechanism, but you certainly can't control it that way. Uh, control the sale of items in particular, uh, in a particular, at a particular point of sale based on the retail profile, you can't do that. 
All right, so then you have um, login per transaction, uh, user zip validation. This is again very important, whether you want to capture uh, the zip that are you, would you be, in the case of a special order, would you like to control the application to not allow you to sell to a particular zip location? You would much rather have it delivered from a completely different store. So that's what it kind of controls. Show transaction head headers, a silly point, whether you want to show these transaction grid headers or not, okay? <coughs> then you have price override lower limit and price override upper limit. What it means is, if you are allowing the cashier to override the price, what percentage, uh, to what percentage you want to go to the lower limit and what percentage in terms of the upper limit? The range in which you would like the cashier to operate when, whenever there's a price override. The price override could be done either by the cashier or by, you could control and it comes up in subsequent sections in retail profile. When is it that you need the manager override? Let's say, for example, you need the manager override to void an item, to print or reprint a transaction, to suspend the sale, etc. So similarly, you would need a manager override to, um, should I say, give an additional discount or change the pricing. Keyboard is US QWERTY keyboard. Then you have display keyboard for authorization. What this means is, very interesting, what that means is, let me show that to you, log out. You see this keyboard, all right? What The reason why we have put that as an option is that, let's say you've asked, you're, the, set, the setting is that anything greater than 20%, you need manager's intervention. And you don't want this keyboard to appear so that I'm not able to type it using like this. I shouldn't be allowed to do that. Okay, so whether you want to display that keyboard or you don't want to display the keyboard, if the keyboard is not displayed, then the manager would come either manually type, swipe the card, maybe have a, a biometric scanner. So there are multiple modes in which you can log into the point of sale. I mean, it brings me to a very different topic. You could either type it the way I just, you just type it. Uh, you could swipe, there could be a card, MSR kind of a card, employee card, you swipe it and the system understand. You could have a biometric reader, you just, uh, you know, thumbprint or print of the finger and system, you will be able to log in. There's a couple of ways in which you can log in, certainly more than one. Uh, so that's what display keyboard for authorization. Transaction mode alignment, should it be right or not? Okay, we've kept this again because the application is available um, in both left to right and right to left languages. Open item edit view automatically. This is when you when you transact an item, you want to edit the item every time you want to sell it. So system will automatically open the edit view. This again is very interesting, new row for a scan. Okay, what that means is if I'm scanning an item at the point of sale, 1001012, sorry, 4001012, and another one, 4001012, same item again. So what's happening here is same item. I have two separate line items. You could, I, if that thing is not switched on, if this thing is not switched on, what the system will do is same item. It will just make the quantity as two here. So that's what it means. Do you want to have new row for a scan? Okay. Um, then you have open item edit on column click, which basically means if I'm here and I click on the column, it should open the item edit view. Sorry. Then you have refund without receipt and exchange without receipt. Again, these are options available to retailers. Would you like to allow the cashier to refund, to go ahead with the refund transaction, even if the customer doesn't have the receipt or similarly for exchange? Okay. Uh, then it has auto update change amount in payment. So when I'm doing a payment transaction, when I'm tendering out, would the system automatically change the amount? Okay. Uh, change amount currency is US dollars. 
okay donation product setup this is again very interesting thing donation product setup I think there was a question somewhere in between which did you answer it all right let me still have a look question Spain so Fezan wants to know on the price overlaid lower limit what is the impact of setting it at a ridiculous number of whatever 999 percentage <laughs> what we're saying is there's no no theoretical uh, lower limit there's no limit as such because this is a demo system you really don't want all of a sudden the system to stop functioning in, in the in the middle of a presentation just because uh, this particular setting did not have an appropriate number there's no other reason Typically, it will be in the range of price price override lower limit would be around 8 to 10 percent. Similarly, override upper would be around 8 to 10 percent. That would be a typical range. This is a ridiculous number mentioned here just to ensure that system doesn't misbehave or rather doesn't stop me from going ahead doing transactions uh, while I'm presenting. Okay, then we were talking about the donation product setup. What this does is uh, if you have if you would have noticed, okay. 100102 all right when I try and tender this out it says would you like to donate 0.55 this 0.55 essentially is we're trying to add this amount to round it off when you when you round off the transaction let's say I want to say yes okay so it just rounds off the transaction to 23 and this again is, uh, a, a, I wouldn't say a popular concept, but certainly a concept in the Western world where the retailer offers this to the consumer that would like to donate. And rather than managing change themselves, okay, at the point of sale, they set up a donation item and all these, all the amount that is collected for rounding off, typically in an accounting world, whatever we collect in the rounding off, is an expense account okay so rather than expensing it off okay what they do is they collect because at the end of the day when you finish when you close the books all over the place okay this won't be a an, this certainly would not be an unearthly amount it will be still in the range of a couple of hundred currency units here and there and it's a good practice it's called the larger corporate social responsibility you could just donate that amount so that how that's the reason why we have this concept of uh, a donation amount. So this, uh, when we talk about uh, how this is created, this essentially is a product called donation product, which is created in Ivan Retail. And also, if you have a core ERP in the back end, you, you create it with, in the ERP as well. Either create here, goes there, or you create in the ERP, comes here. Okay, and that's, and then you map it. So in this particular screen here, when I select it, it shows me the list of my product master. <clears throat> it shows my product masters. It takes a while because there's so many of them. And from here, you pick it up, uh, whichever product that you want to select. So that should come up. It doesn't matter. So that's how, uh, so there you are. So this, these are the products that I have, and one of them, let's say, is donation. I search. This is the rounding of product that I have. So this is basically a non-stock, saleable, non-purchasable item. If you want to get slightly more specific, that's what it is all about. Okay. Then, sorry, sorry. Do you want to have refund for promotional items? So if an item is in promotion, do you want to allow refunds on that? Do you want to print suspended transaction? Uh, okay, and delete suspended transactions at the end of the day. Let me try and answer these, uh, address, I mean, rather explain these two. So uh, typically what happens, so let's say you are, you go to a retail store and you are kind of tendering or checking out and you realize, okay, oh, I forgot my wallet in the car and then you walk out of the car get the wallet till last such time the transaction the cashier doesn't have to wait for you he just suspends the transaction and starts 
uh, catering to the next customer in the queue. Now, <clears throat> if a transaction is suspended, do you want to print the transaction? Now, it, there could be a legitimate case as what I just said. I just, I just forgot the, my wallet in the car. Or it could be the other way around. Let, let me try and tell you how people kind of use the system to their advantage. So the cashier, he scans all the items. Okay, he suspends the transaction. He prints the suspended transaction. Okay, collects the money, let's say in cash. Okay, and then deletes the suspended transaction. So what really happened all of a sudden is the customer got whatever he had to. He, he did buy, he, he customer did get a legitimate receipt thereof. But the cashier, what he did was the inventory never got reduced because he had suspended the transaction and then deleted the transaction. So in the system, the inventory never got out, okay, and he just collected. So that's one place where the pilferage really starts. So we're saying, do you want to print a suspended transaction or not? Do you want to control it that way? Okay, uh, you can say print suspended transaction allowed, but then when you want to recall a suspended transaction, a manager override is required. So you could control it that way also. So I'm saying print of a suspended transaction in my case is not allowed, but that's where something which sounds rather silly as to why do you want to print a suspend, why should there be a setting to print or not print a suspended transaction emanates from the experience that we've had. Um, and I won't name the geography of the customer where this was a big challenge, the very big challenge that there were a lot of pilferages and they just couldn't control it. So that's where we included this. Similarly, delete suspended transactions at the end of the day. So the moment you do end of day transaction, all suspended transactions get automatically deleted. Automatically add cashier as a salesperson. Again, uh, more of a supermarket environment where the cashier is automatically added as a salesperson. Warn, warn if transaction line item has no salesperson speciality retail case mandatory salesperson per transaction line item again speciality retail case show negative inventory resolution <coughs> excuse me so what it means is if i am doing a negative inventory resolution would the system would you like the system to show that to you or not use quick complete cash as a payment type this is again one of the buttons on the point of sale we'll use this very often uh, not only on the terminal point of sale, but also on the mobile point of sale. So we want to use a quick complete as a payment type within as a cash payment. Um, confirmation required for quick complete, yes or no. Complete tendering on zero balance. Do you want to have that very obvious settings? Okay, restrict, restrict search of other post transactions. Okay, what this means is Okay, imagine I have a retail store then that has a mobile point of sale and also has a terminal point of sale, all right? <clears throat> In my session yesterday, I did mention that you could do a point of sale transaction on the mobile device and you can then direct the customer to the terminal point of sale from where you can retrieve a transaction which is on the mobile point of sale uh, on the terminal point of sale and go ahead and do it and complete the transaction. This tick ensures whether you want to restrict such a thing or you don't want to restrict such a thing. Okay, then you have use last selected event for the next transaction. So events essentially in, in Ivan detail or should I say tags, okay, that you attach to every transaction. Uh, let's say one of the event is uh, uh, Christmas sale. It's too big an event actually, but okay, for sake of, for lack of a better example. If you want to tag all your transactions to a particular event so that you are able to analyze it at a later stage, you define the events and attach the event to a transaction. And what this tick does is use the last selected event for the next transaction. Okay, uh, open product search if barcode is not required. Again, um, on the point of sale, if you're not able to scan it, it should automatically open the product search screen. So let me avoid the transaction. So I'm talking about this place. If you're not able to scan it, then automatically open the item search screen. That's what that small little tech does. <clears throat> 
uh, allow combining multiple transactions different than the sale transaction, single transaction. It's like pretty much simple in state, very explanatory in itself. By default, use current business state in transaction search. So when you're trying to search transactions, okay, let me show this to you. And I get stuck very often. I go here, this is called the user menu, and I go to transaction search. And it says, by default, use the current business state. Whatever business state that I'm running on, it'll automatically use the date from and date to. That's what this tick does. Okay. Um, this is just a theme that I have, different themes, the way, the, you know, uh, my, uh, should I say, management console or the point of sale skin should look like. We just keep it at Ivan Metro uh, skin. Allow login if business state is not the same as the current date. Okay, so the concept of a business state and the system date or the current date. <clears throat> What this means is imagine you have a, a, a near 24 by 7 operation, 7-Eleven in the eastern part of the world, uh, a big shopping mall in Dubai, okay, a store in, in the Dubai mall, uh, or, or, a, or a business that runs more than 12 hours in one go. All right, so, uh, so by the calendar, you may have changed the date. Let's say midnight, the date changes, but you may still be you may still like to record the business or the transactions in a previous business date. So system maintains two different dates, the business date and the system date. And um, once you do the end of day, that's where it kind of sets, uh, resets the whole thing. So a business date becomes a current date. So in this, uh, in this uh, installation that I have, if you notice at the bottom, my system date is March the 12th. Whereas my, uh, this is my system date, where my business date is March the 1st. And there is a reason why I kept it separately because if I have to show you the end of day transaction, then I would end of day, end of business day, uh, March the 1st, and then uh, pick up a next business date for transaction. So what this tick allows you to do is, would you allow logging in if the business date is not the same as the current date? So. In real world, normally speaking, normal businesses, uh, your business state and a system date would be the same. And in case it is different, that means the end of day did not happen properly or did not have a, happen at all, then should you allow system to log in or not? Uh, allow, allow recalling multiple suspended transactions. So if you have more than one suspended transaction, can I recall more than, or more than one? Allow coupon on the lowest price. Uh, log voided transaction again this is more from pilfrage standpoint so uh, you know do a transaction and um, you can print the receipt and this void the transaction so should you want to log all those transactions which are void or not and there's one very interesting dashboard that we have specifically for pilfrages how do you manage pilfrages the different so while it is suggestive in one way that these are the different options you could use to for pilfrages. It is also a, a, a one single dashboard which allows, and especially supermarket retailers uh, or large format retail stores to manage pilfrages. Okay, then it says maximum number of lines in a transaction. Uh, there isn't any limit, and this is a reasonable limit, I would say that 99,999. Enable printing for transaction preview. Uh, product product image in search, product height, uh, product image height in the search, allow tax-free items or not. The point of sale layout is, in this case, is, is the apparel template, and there are multiple of them available. Uh, I think I did sh very briefly showed it to you yesterday. So I have a apparel template. I showed the metro template. This is one of my favorite. Okay, let me show the grocery template. This is very interesting. So let's say I say edit. Okay, so imagine in your mind what you're seeing. This is my current template. Okay, this is my apparel store. This is my apparel template. Let me try and show you something which is completely different. Okay, the idea is to impress upon the fact that uh, the entire point of sale can be designed using the, the point of sale designer. And uh, the way it is managed is you have five button, different button panels, uh, and every panel has a separate template to itself. 
So there you go. Okay. So it's, if you look at it closely, it's the same. You have item search, customer search, just a main tab. You have the discounts tab. Okay, the transaction modes, etc. And here I'm showing fruits. I could show vegetables. I could show drinks. I could show dairy products. I could show confectionery items. Everything remaining the same. The point we're trying to make here is that okay, it is fairly customizable. If you try and compare this with, let's say, this one, it's like very different. So you could you could all configure this separately. And what is interesting to know um, is that you would typically set it up on a test system or, or, or wherever. And once you have done that, you can export this template out and then import the template in into a different place altogether in the, in the production system. Okay. So in this case, for this particular retail profile, what is the uh, apparel? Uh, what is the post layout? I'm using a parallel template. Import file delimiter is comma. Uh, when you say import file, so if you want to, if you want to be importing files, for example, uh, files of good receipt or stock transfers or inventory counting, etc., what should be the delimiter? Okay. Uh, now show available items only for promotions and upsells. That means uh, only show those items which are promotion upsells. Check for cash or status. And check for printer status. This again is very interesting. More from Pilfred's standpoint. Uh, so if the cash drawer is open, okay, the point of sale would not let you do a transaction if the cash drawer is open or if the printer, printer status, as in the printer is open, okay, it will not allow you to do transaction. Again, imagine it from a pre standpoint. These are some of the controls that we have. Okay. Uh, on that, I will take a pause and address any questions that we have. Maybe Wish has been trying to answer. Um, Fezan wants to know, if we do not log by the transaction, does that mean we have no record uh, available in the system? Uh, you would have a record in the system. This is basically more from a pilfage control standpoint, that how many transactions are being voided. There is a, anyways a big audit log the system maintains. There is a big one that system maintains automatically without any kind of user intervention, which is anyways maintained. Uh, but this is again specifically from a pilfage control standpoint. Uh, all right, now let's go to barcode scanning at the point of sale. What it does is allow product scanning, yes, allow customer scanning, yes, allow transaction scanning, salesperson scanning, coupon scanning, and barcode scanning of loyalty cards. So basically, what all things do you want to allow at the scanning at the, at the bar, uh, sorry, barcode scanning at the point of sale level, sorry. Then then we also have something called a quick button panel, okay? Uh, and the metrics product information panel. Let me try and show that to you. Um, operations. No, it's, this is not what I was talking about, but let me still try. So this is one place where I have the product list, and if I search, it gives me one uh, view of all the items. Uh, whether so this is the particular product, it gives me the information about the product in terms of um, uh, what is the product code, the description, the short description, costing method, product group, class, UM, base points, vendor, sales tax, etc. All that goods, uh, and you keep going on the right hand side. Okay, does it have upsells or not? Is it a matrixized item? What are the product attributes? Okay, is it refundable, exchangeable? All the information that I capture in the in the item master in the vertical grid form is available now in the horizontal manner. This is one information. Then it says, does it have child items? Basically, color, size, style. Okay, then I, then I have the inventory view of that particular item. If I I am currently in the Avenue store. In the Avenue store, in the saleable location, I have 932 pieces available. Whereas across the entire enterprise, these are my uh, stocks available: 109 here, 10 here, uh, and it also talks about 
how much is on fulfillment, how much is available, how much is in transit, how much is available to sell, etc. So it gives me the inventory view. Shows any upsells, any alternate products, the matrix view if it all, uh, because this one is not a matrix item. I'll pick up a matrix item and I'll show that to you as to how does this screen look like. This is one and the thing that I was talking about matrix product information panel, if I click this, I don't have one, but uh, uh, I'm not able to explain. I'm so sorry about that. But when you're seeing, when you see a matrix item, when you search for a matrix item, which is color size style item at the point of sale, at that point, how should the information be displayed is what this is all about. And I'll come, Wish, please make a note of this. I will mention this separately as to what are these two settings all about. And I also pick up an item which is which is a uh, color science style matrix item. So that becomes that much more clear. Okay. So we, we spoke very briefly about the transaction screen settings. Okay. Then manager override is required or not. It means uh, when the cashier is doing a transaction and he's whenever, let's say he exceeds the cost protection, then a manager is uh, over manager login is required. Credit limit manager is manager's login is required. When you reprint the receipts, manager's uh, intervention is required, and so on and so forth. When you void a sale, manager is not required, but when you void an item, manager override is required. When I say manager override, I mean that the manager has to log in. So let me try and show that to you here. Okay, I'm on the point of sale 100102 and 100106, let's say. Okay, and I want to delete this transaction. I say void an item. I said you want to delete this item. I say yes. And it says this requires a manager or why do you want to continue? Yes. And the manager logs in. And that's how the transaction the, the line item gets deleted. So that's what so these are the different options available for manager override. Uh, just to ensure that you know uh, you are able to retain the entire session better of course the, it is being recorded and will be available for playing again uh, I would also like to mention that these uh, sessions are also available oh, sorry these I won't say sessions but these these uh, on the knowledge portal there are articles available which talk about uh, the different settings or different topics that I'm talking about I'm just reminded of this because manager override is one of the articles that I had written. So let me just, you go to the knowledge portal, you sign in. Once you're signed in, go to the knowledge base. And you search for, let's say, manager override. There you are. So this is one article available here. So just in case you uh, you get a feeling that I'm kind of skimming through it very fast. Okay. So you could just have a look at it and what I'm also going to do is um, possibly tomorrow explain to you uh, for all the topics that we are trying to cover in the agenda for all the topics that we're covering the agenda there is a supporting knowledge article and uh, possibly a video as well so I'll upload that list and I'll show you where the list is available so that you can refer to it should there be a need for uh, you to refer it but that's what uh, I just realized on the manager or override functionality that there's an article I had written. Similarly, so this talks about all the options or the situations where you need a manager override. Okay, customer search, product search, sale information edit, transaction search, fulfill. Why would you need manager override for transaction search? Silly, but it's there. Uh, fulfillment return product after return product after return date is expired. Very good. Suspend and recall. 
product surcharge waiver while return, payment cancellation, cashing in, cashing out. Cashing in, cashing out means uh, when you're taking cash out of the cash drawer, is cash out, and the cash in is when you're putting money back into the cash drawer, is a cash in, and a transaction refund. So these are the different settings available uh, where you can s decide whether a manager override is required or not. Then you have poll display. Let me just tell you the ones which are really important. Poll display messages. So when you complete a set sale, thank you for shopping at the apparel store, please do it again. Ideally, in the, in the idle state, what should be the message? And uh, when you start the transaction, what should be the message? Similarly, discount details is maximum sale discount percentage allowed on this uh, on the point of sale where this retail profile is attached is 100%. The silly numbers more because I don't want the transaction to stop for these settings, but think about it. Maximum sale discount percentage allowed, maximum sale discount amount allowed at the sale level, then similarly percentage in an amount at the line item level. The reason codes required. Okay, so apart from the um, the manager override, you can also specify the reason codes. Okay, so why why are you doing a trying to do a particular transaction? Let's say if I'm doing a good receipt transaction, I have the option of specifying whether you want to specify any re reason code or not. Similarly, comments are required or not. So not only a reason code, but you can also require uh, a comment. Reason code is basically imagine to be drop down. You pick up one reason from the drop down, but comment is where you the cashier will have to kind of freely type it. Okay, then you have point of sale wild card. This is interesting. So you want to change the quantity, say at the rate. You want to change the price, say star. When you want to mention discount, say percentage, and for discount amount, say hash. Let's try and do this. Quantity is at the rate. So I go here. One zero zero one zero two at the rate five. What happens? Yep. So I change the quantity to five. Well, this additional line item is because of I'm running a promotion. Buy four and get the fifth of the lowest value for free. So I basically paid for only four pieces. One of them is for free. Twenty four ninety five. One of them is free. Okay. And so the, the, that's how the the wild cards really work. Okay, for price and for discount and for this thing. Then you have email receipts. You can specify email receipts, yes. Email address for the receipt is this. Email template is this particular template. What report do you want to use? And what are the receipt sending word? Let me try and answer them one at, address them one at a time. So obviously address is, is obvious. Email template. Okay, so when I click this, it shows up predefined certain templates that we have in the system. So I'm picking up this one, which is electronic transaction receipt. These, most of these are for loyalty purposes. These are, this is my campaign. This is for in-app notifications where the, the request comes from the cashier and the response goes from the manager. We'll come to this. In fact, notifications again, an article that I had written so you can just search for notifications and you'll get to understand it better. Notifications in uh, as an in app text and email in uh, as in management console and point of sale, and also in in the mobile point of sale. So pick up one of these, okay? So that's my email template, and the report is the data for this uh, template comes from a report called transaction receipt. Okay, so there are two things here one is the template, the other is the one that has the data. And the receipt sending mode could either be the enterprise or the store. So which SMTP is to be used? I could send it from the enterprise or I could send it from the store. That's what this means. Let me see if there are any questions to be answered. So Anand had to leave. That's okay. Uh, not a problem. Um, and I already answered the question from Fezan for log, uh, logging the wire transactions. Is good. I think I've well passed the hour. Um, 
I just want to have a quick check. Can do I have time for another five seven minutes? Please raise your hands. Uh, and if I don't, then I can cover this in my uh, in my session tomorrow. I'll be slightly fast. If you guys allow me five seven minutes, I'll finish this. And wanted to show you a, a, a an actual till, or we could cover till tomorrow. Which is up to you. Some of you are saying yes. Most of you are saying that Manish, we have had enough. <laughs> All right. I, I I think I'll still go ahead. I think I'll still go ahead. I think I'll still go ahead and uh, uh, show you the till and the concept of a till and how that really works. I have always had difficulties. I could find I found it very difficult to get my head around. Uh, Carlos has left. That's okay. No problem. Um, and then Anand had to leave. Uh, David Webb says, "Please continue." Thank you, David. Okay, all right. So this is this is easy. This is done. I think I would pretty much done here. Customer display setting, product display. Um, one of the most important. Hang on. This is again customer display setting. Is not nothing too great about it. It's simple stuff. This is simple stuff. We can give it a pass. All right, so let's let's try and now pick up a slightly, um, a, a, a rather a very important topic. Okay, a very important topic. Um, um, hang on, people are leaving. I'll anyway, in any case, I'll cover this. Uh, I'll in any ways, I'll in any case, I'll cover this tomorrow again. So I won't uh, remove my setup. All right, go to till management. So tills essentially are if you if you can relate to a a cash drawer, okay. Till essentially are um, that part of a cash drawer, which is um, the, the thing, the tray, which is in a cash drawer. I would just want to show that to you. Give me a second. I just want to show that to you. <clears throat> so when you when you go to the retail store, there's always a cash drawer that opens, and you see uh, that tray that has those, uh, should I say, uh, clips of sorts where the cash is kept that is the removable part is what is the till just one second just stay with me for a minute so what you're seeing now is the actual kind of drawer Okay, and this, the removable part, the one that can be removed, this essentially is the till. Okay, the reason I'm making a big deal out of this is is because uh, till a very long time I did not know what a till is and how it really works. Okay, so I thought, uh, and I was rather embarrassed of sorts kind of ask so what is a till and how does it look like so that's uh, basically a till so in, in your mind imagine and there is a big article on till management also uh, which explains as to uh, what is till how did it really work okay so let's go back to the the product okay and see what the till management has to offer um, most of the people are leaving. I'm so sorry. I was not able to manage the time appropriately. But tills, essentially, as I said, are the removable part of a cash drawer. Okay. So in your mind, uh, while the system offers a lot of a lot of uh, flexibility, but in your mind, imagine the till to be one on one as one is to one combination between a point of sale that you define and a point of sale will have a till. Okay. Though a point of sale can have more than one tills. But in your mind, when you're trying to understand it for the first time, imagine a point of sale to a till is a one is to one combination. So what I've done is I've defined these different point of sales. Okay, I have the terminal point of sale. I have a mobile point of sale for iOS and a mobile point of sale for Android, and I have another till for user two. Okay, so these are the different tills that are available. Okay, in your uh, setup, this would this would come this would be showing as a master till. I just call it uh, the list of the tills, okay? And the second is this one, 
which in your in your system would also say till status. This is basically status of the till. A till can have multiple different statuses. It could be assigned, it could be new, it could be unassigned, it could be removed. So what I did yesterday, I did one end of day transaction and did not do any transaction on these two. So these are new. I did just one transaction on this till. So it says assigned. You can also set up uh, in your retail profile. So reassign tills at the end of the day. So you don't have to every time assign a till to the user and assign it, sorry, assign a till to a cash drawer and then assign that to a user. So it's a slightly complicated process, but in your mind, you have to imagine that a till to a point of sale is a one is to one combination. As long as you're able to get thing, that thing right, you would not be able to fumble anywhere. That's number one. Second, the status of the till. It could either be assigned to the point of sale or it could not be assigned to the point of sale. When it is not assigned, it's in a new state. It's just lying there. Okay, once it is assigned, then it is assigned to that particular point of sale. All right. So you keep on doing transactions through the course of the day, okay? And there comes a point in time at the end of the day where the shift gets over, the cashier does his end of day part, which is the X-tape report. Again, an article available and also you know, on the point of sale. Just void the transaction. There's an X-tape report that is generated. This is at the point of sale, mind you. At the point of sale, there is something called like an X-tape report. You run the X-tape report, it shows you uh, all the transactions that have been done so far for a particular pause, how much cash, how much gift certificate, and, and the entire details about it. Okay, you print it, and as a cashier, you print, you reconcile, you remove the till, and put it in the safe box for the store manager to, to come and uh, count the till. So once, and you can have the same device, the same point of sale terminal can now imagine in your mind have multiple tills. So one till belongs to Manish, the other belongs to let's say uh, Felipe. So you, you, you could you could have multiple different tills available. Once you're done at the end of the day, you go to the end of the day, then these are the different options available. You first count the till. This is what the cashier typically would be doing. Before I go there for the sake of simplicity, because these are, sorry, Because these are not being used, I will just delete them. It will make my life easy when I'm trying to do the end of day. Similarly, this one, say so delete. Yes. So I just have one till to complete. Okay. And incidentally, if you have a single store, single point of sale uh, setup, okay, then the entire end of day can actually be done from the point of sale itself. You don't really have to go to the management console to do it. So let's go to the end of day. I do the till count. There's only one and double click this. Okay, it will tell me by the system. This is the amount that I have to mention. One eight six five point six. Sorry, six one. This is 100. Okay, so there's no variance now. I press OK. It is still in the uh, it is still in the assigned state. Okay, then I say remove the till. Till removed successfully. So imagine the physical process in your mind. Okay, then you close it. One eight six five point six one one hundred. Press OK. Proceed. Yes. The till is now closed. Now the last step is to finalize it. Double click. The till status is closed. If you noticed, one eight. 65.61 and this is 100. This last leg would be done by the by the store manager. Should you want to proceed? Yes. All right.
right? So I've, all my tills are closed now. I go to the end of day. Okay, I'm on, system automatically picks up the next business date as March the 2nd. I'm keeping it March the 2nd on purpose so that if I will do it again and again. I should have the, those dates available because had if I change it to, let's say, um, 12th of March, I would not be able to do end of day because the next date would be 13th. So I'll much rather keep it like this. I say start. It checks the till status. A slightly anxious moments. Please bear with me. End of day process completed successfully. I'm okay. All right. And when I go back to the point of sale, I will have to. I think I should shut it down. Because it still says the business status. Let me log in again. When you try and log in again, it'll ask you, uh, okay, let, let, let it come up. It'll automatically, yeah. So imagine the, the, the physical process in the mind, the real thing that happens on the ground or uh, in the retail store. Uh, the cashier walks in, he goes to the store manager, he gets his, his till, the physical tray, and he then goes to the, the point of sale and, puts it, and logs in and puts the tray in. And before he puts the tray in, the process that's, that is going to happen. And let's see what the process is all about. It still says my business date is different than my system date. I say, yes, please go ahead. Now it says, this is the user ID password for this user. I say, clock in. Okay, the moment I clock in, it's these are the, uh, the float amount that if I want to mention. Okay, in case there is a, a float amount that I want to mention. I press, okay, go ahead. And it'll say, okay, do you want to print this? Do you want to print the cash store account to see? I say no, forget it. And now I can start my day for, I can start my second day. So that's essentially uh, brings me to the end of day two. I did try to cover a few of the uh, few of the topics. The most important ones I did, I will repeat the end of day transaction again tomorrow for the benefit of people who couldn't. Uh, but for now, uh, for the purpose of the session today, I think I'm done. Uh, most of the people had to leave. I'm so sorry. Uh, I will manage my time better tomorrow. Um, but if you have any questions, please go ahead. If you have any questions, please go ahead and I'll try and answer them or we can certainly, we'll certainly are convening tomorrow anyways. Oh, you're most welcome, Lister. Lister says thank you, most welcome. Peters, yes, Peter, thank you very much. Thank you for being patient with me. I took I took more time, but that's fine. Yes, certainly we'll meet tomorrow. Um, David says, thank you. Maureen says, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, guys, I'll on that, I'll close the, the webinar today and with the promise of meeting tomorrow at the same time and with a better time management, I would say. Thank you so much, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.